All right. Welcome back to my podcast. I don't even know what episode this is. I think it's nine. I think it's episode nine. So I'm just going to go with that. But welcome back to my podcast, you guys. I have a guest here. His name's Sam. You just said your last name. T. Lemons. (laughs) T. Lemons. He is a therapist and you specialize in men that struggle with porn addictions, things like that. And I'm very excited because I was talking recently on my podcast on a different episode about uh, the sexual revolution and just OnlyFans work and how it's it's affecting men. And so I wanted to bring a therapist on to actually dive deeper into these issues and then obviously talk about some other things um, just to help marriages. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself yeah, in any course. other way. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. really happy to be here. So, yeah, like I said, my name is Sam Tielemans. I'm a licensed therapist and I've been working with this particular challenge for over a decade now. Mm-hmm. And it affects so many marriages. This is one of the main reasons why couples divorce. Mm. And I just have seen it affect friends of mine. I've seen it affect so many of the clients that I work with. And so, yeah, it's my my calling. I, I, I put it as like helping relationships heal. And this is a part of what I think can help do that. That's amazing. And we talked a little bit briefly on the phone. Um, and so I'll go over uh, everybody. I always have my little notes with me on every podcast episode. So that's great. Yeah, <laughs> it that's helps great. me because <laughs> I can go everywhere. Um, but we briefly talked a little bit on the phone. And so I wanted to share with people that everybody that's on my podcast knows that I believe in God. I incorporate God into everything, even uh, the diagnosis with BPD and paranoid schizophrenia. I healed a lot of these symptoms through God and then obviously science and the psychology of things. So I add everything into it. And so today I will say that you are also a believer, mm-hmm. which I love that because I think that's missing. And when we have that as a foundation, that really helps us with the mix of psychologists, with the mix of help and therapy um, to really uh, work through these issues. So I just wanted to state that. Um, so I'm very excited about today's conversation. Yeah, likewise. So just like a brief as well, um, one thing I did talk about, and I'll just give a brief for anybody coming to this episode and did not watch previous ones, um, which you could check it out. But I did talk about that I was doing a lot of research on the fact that men and women are different, biologically different. Um, I was a hardcore feminist. I thought that men and women were the same. I got some hard truths that that is not (laughs) true. Um, And if it was the truth then there wouldn't be such a huge porn industry and the the sex work industry and prostitution and sex trafficking wouldn't be such a big industry and it's with amongst men so they clearly have a deeper desire for intimacy and for sex um and i think these things are preying off of that so i wanted just to get your insight a little bit on my first question is do you think that only fans and the access to porn is ruining men and how how is that so? Uh, I think it has a huge impact on men, specifically on families, because like you said, there's a whole industry designed to get people. In fact, okay, I'll share with you. So mm-hmm. uh, we live in Las Vegas. Right. There's a billboard right off of the 95 and Russell that says uh, it's advertising a strip club. Mm-hmm. And on the billboard itself, it says destroying marriages since 2012. Wow. I know. It's crazy. It's like, wow. it's wild. So I did a little video just to show that. These people, they don't care about you. They don't care about your family. They don't care about your kids. All they really care about is your money. Right. So this whole industry devoted to preying on people and trying to target one of the most fundamental drives that we all have as people. Right. right. It's like I was listening to a neuroscientist by the name of uh, Andrew Huberman. Mm. So he speaks a lot about pornography use and how the impact it has on the brain for, for, for men and women. And he said the, the, the two drives that every animal has, any animal in the kingdom, which he includes us, is to protect their young mm. and to make more of itself. So ro- right. procreate. And so that's such a fundamental drive is to procreate, to have children. And so this industry preys on that and really uh, is only focused on making money off of the, the natural drives that we all have. And I think, again, as a Christian, they're God-given drives. Right. But those drives can be misused. Yes, we talked about the other phone. I love how you worded that, that it's being misused. I think there's, just to add to you, I'm sorry, um, but I think that there is beauty in men having a drive to procreate and to have, you know, want to have sex and have intimacy. I think that was a driving factor for them creating so many things. Um, 
I looked up a study that 90% of inventions are made by men or, and, and men are the ones building houses and, and, and building bridges and creating. And it was through their drive to want respect and intimacy and to be top dog, really. I mean, I'm just going to say it like that. Um, you know, be desired by women and, and show that they are perfectly capable of providing and um, creating to women and demonstrating that. And then women want them because our biological nature is we want a man that can do so because yeah. we're going to carry the babies. And there's a beauty in that, but it's, it is being misused. And then we're like berating women, uh, men, I'm sorry, um, we're beating them down for that desire, you know? So I don't know if you have any comments yeah, on I that. Mean, I, yeah, I just, I think if there's this stereotype of like uh, all all men care about is sex all women care about is whatever it's like money or like that's not it's not true number one and number yeah. two i think it's just when that's being misused it does show up in destructive ways yeah so like you said earlier i think or your question earlier was in what way does it affect people so there's such interesting research now that talks about the impact that pornog pornography has on the brain mm. or literally can change the circuitry the dopamine reward center circuitry so that it decreases motivation, it decreases, so many people struggle with decreased self-esteem and guilt and shame that goes along with this because if, it, if it's against their values, but they can't stop doing it because of how strong that dopamine circuitry is, then wow. it has big impacts on somebody emotionally, psychologically, and, 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 and like we talked about earlier with regard to their families. Right. So how is it like impacting the family when someone does have a porn addiction? It's so, so many women consider pornography use by their partner as cheating. And when you're in a relationship with somebody who there is this sense of betrayal that comes with porn use, it completely shatters any degree of trust that they have. It totally shatters their ability to feel safe with them. And so many women that I work with, they feel almost like PTSD like symptoms. Wow. Where they feel depressed, they feel anxious, they're uh, these uh, ruminating thoughts, they think about this nonstop, they lose sleep, fits of anger, hopelessness. Like it's a huge impact on a woman when pornography use is happening in their relationship without her knowing about it. Wow. So when she starts to, dis when she discovers my husband or my partner has been watching this stuff, her whole world changes. Her whole, who she thought that he was is totally different. How she thought the relationship was is totally different. So it really just redefines everything in her mind, which causes this like free fall kind of a, a feeling for her. The relationship was a source of safety, but now I don't even know who this person is anymore. I can't trust them. I can't trust myself. How could I have missed this? What does this all mean? Does he even love me? Like it, it just it, it has such a massive effect on, I think, a, a woman when her husband or, or partner's viewing this well and I, my question is 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 why do you think so i mean i think for me that's not really i don't think so a factor i mean i don't think so i mean it could be <laughs> completely hidden but <laughs> i don't think so um but i never really thought about it i never really thought about if i were to find out something like that how i would feel and then i think that you probably as a woman go through mixed feelings of like okay well it's not a person so maybe it's okay so why do you think like what do you think goes through a woman's mind when that happens yeah i mean i think people take it differently so like you said like if you were to discover okay this person who i thought i knew is doing this stuff you'd think well i guess it's not him physically acting out with somebody i think there's a big percentage of women who do feel it the same way as cheating. And I think the reason why is because a husband, I, I say husband, it can be boyfriend, fiance, whoever. Right. If a man's attention is going somewhere away from her, mm. even if it's on a screen, he's still thinking about her. He's still looking at her. He's maybe fantasizing about her. When, again, this is what I think it affects the sexual relationship as well, because the woman starts to feel like, well, wasn't I enough? You're looking wow, at all these yeah. other people and they're not me. I don't look like that. I'll never be that. So mm -hmm. then they start to have these insecurities about, am I not enough for him? Does he prefer somebody else? And so all of those fears, I think, create insecurities in a relationship where she starts to question everything. Wow. And I want to, I actually want to talk a little bit about how it could affect your sex life too, because actually just thinking right now is like, I have a friend who she would always masturbate before and, or use toys in her relationship. 
And therefore, she was never satisfied anymore during sex. And it always has to go above and beyond or you always have to bring toys or you always have to bring things into the bedroom. So I don't know if you have um, just from clients and stuff how it is, has affected their sex life. Yeah, I think it, it has a huge effect. So, again, uh, if anybody's interested in more information on how this affects the brain, Dr. Andrew Huberman, he's a neuroscientist out of Stanford. He's got some such he's such interesting information and studies. He talks about how, so when somebody watches pornography, it spikes their dopamine levels. So we all have this baseline of dopamine. And when we eat food, when we have sex, when we do something enjoyable, dopamine is released. And that's on purpose. He says when somebody watches pornography, it spikes the dopamine levels artificially. And because there's such a big spike, the dopamine level crashes down below baseline. So there's this like high And then there's this emptiness that happens afterwards. Wow. And he said that when people watch pornography, they're training their brain to associate sexual activity with watching somebody else. And it's not you participating in it. So a lot of people struggle with what they call as porn-induced erectile dysfunction. So in their relationship, they're not able to perform sexually because their brain has been so conditioned Mm -hmm. to have a sexual response based on what they watch, not what they're engaged in personally. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. It has such a big... It's like uh, Pavlov's dog, you know, Mm -hmm. where you ring the bell and then the researcher would give them food and then the dog would salivate. So eventually he did that a ton of times and the bell was associated with food. So just Mm -hmm. the sound of the bell would trigger the dog to salivate just because those had been been conditioned together. Wow. So it's no different when it's pornography use. When you're watching somebody else engage in sexual behavior, your brain is is becoming aroused by what you're watching. And when you're in a real life situation, you don't have the same experiences Mm -hmm. because you're in first person instead of watching somebody else do it. Wow. I actually had a family member who um, had an addiction to sex in general and no longer, he could no longer um, enjoy sex just with his partner he had to watch it and even go as far as going to sex clubs and watching everybody else have sex in order to feel aroused that's really sad oh my gosh it's really sad the impact i think that's just again it's a distortion of what it should be Mm. sexual intimacy is designed to not only for procreation but it helps couples to connect even more right it helps them feel closer to one another it's an expression of love yes there's a physical element where there's pleasure there of course but there's so many things that it is supposed to do and when somebody is struggling with a sex addiction or a porn addiction it's totally one-dimensional it's just focused on the pleasure right and because it's only focused on the pleasure that's why people need novelty it, to the degrees that they do, like sex clubs, and we have to do all this stuff, and they have to keep pushing the limits because the brain, again, going back to those dopamine levels, if the brain expects dopamine to be up here to be satisfying, right? there is so much that has to happen to create this experience up here, watching porn, going to sex clubs, doing all this stuff, because everyday life is no longer satisfying because the dopamine levels are pushed up so high that everyday life with a partner doesn't hit that mark. So they feel like they have to, it's like drinking, right? If somebody were to drink two beers, then they get a buzz. Mm -hmm. If they do two beers for the next month, it's not going to do anything. So they need three. Right. And then they need a higher concentration of alcohol because the brain just adapts and gets used to it. So yeah, I think it has just a huge impact on somebody's sexual relationship. It's like anything could be abused really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then obviously sex can be abused even if you're in a relationship and you think like this is not me going around and having casual sex or being around with multiple people but you're still satan is very tricky like he will find a way into your bedroom and into your marriage in any sort of way and um just pervert things that are supposed to be holy and good so thank you for breaking that that. down no no i think that's such a good way to put that because i mean his whole goal is to break relationships Mm -hmm. he doesn't want strong marriages nope he doesn't want kids to grow up with faith kids to have self-esteem like his whole goal is to undermine everything that's good and he is a master at counterfeits Mm. so what more potent counterfeit could there be than taking a sexual relationship which is like divinely designed it's right by it's it's on purpose that we have this that god has ordained this So, of course, the number one thing he's going to want to try to get in the way of is that and come up with counterfeit ways of 
getting this physical drive met, but at the detriment of so much, right? Yeah. It just becomes this one dimensional thing instead of it being there to foster a relationship and bring kids into a family. He's going to want to, yeah, attack the most sacred things that we have, right. family being one of them. And this is just such a clever way that he's done that. Man, uh, you worded that so well. <laughs> no, it's, it's something I talk about on my podcast in every single way. I think this is just another great way to talk about how sneaky the devil is. Because even with feminism, what it started off being, which was just for women to have equal rights, has now turned into a man bashing, male bashing, destroy the nuclear family Um Men are not the head of the house anymore. We're all going to have the equal say, um, which just leads straight down a rabbit hole for women because they end up not wanting that in the long run. It's just a mess. And he's done yeah. a very great job at taking things, that, anything that was meant to help us and, you know, or be beautiful or God's used as a beautiful design. And it's been it's been destroyed. And we're living in such a crazy time for yes, sure. I agree. hundred percent. Yeah. So. Um, I'm going to get into some other questions here. I, I love that this was the beginning of, of it, but I'm going to, I kind of told you, I'm going to say some stuff for some wow factor. Let's do it. So I'm going to get into <laughs> some crazy questions and see what you think. So as someone, I, I, I used to do only fans when I was younger. I wasn't a porn star and I wasn't naked, but I was young and I had this big following. I was like, oh, how can I make fast money real quick? I got onto that. Um, and it was a slippery slope for me, for sure, because I was on it and men were like, oh, you know, we'll pay you more if you do this, if you do that or whatever. And I was like, dang, like this, all this money if I do this. But I realized within a short amount of time that I was going to be trading my morals very fast. Satan is very, again, once yeah. again, very tricky. That was flashed in my face. And I prayed off the fact that men like would give me all of this money at such a fast you know, just hand over the money just to see you, even if you're not naked, just to see you. And um, I just wanted to know your thoughts about right now, this whole OnlyFans situation and maybe advice to young women who are thinking about doing that, advice to men that are thinking about subscribing to OnlyFans, um, trying to normalize it, trying to say it is, you know, a boss babe type of thing. It's 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 your income. It's your hustle. Um, what is your advice or what are your thoughts about it? I think <clears throat> that's just another platform where the same type of problematic behavior exists. Mm. So whether or not somebody's naked or engaging in like full on intercourse, it's the same problem, right? It's something that's sacred is being distorted and it's a counterfeit. And ultimately, I think it does affect so many women. There's, it's, again, I'm, I'm so glad that this is being an issue that's more and more talked about. People who, women who are in the porn industry who are exiting that yeah. share just like horror stories of how they're abused. Nobody cares about them. Their self-esteem is totally in the gutter. Yeah. And it affects them psychologically and emotionally in such devastating ways. And I think, like you said, with OnlyFans, I think there's different levels. There's different degrees of it. But it's still under the same umbrella as a counterfeit and it's impacting some, it has the potential to really impact somebody's self-esteem, their spirituality, emotional well-being. And so, yeah, my encouragement, my advice is that number one, it's just, it's not sustainable. Yeah. I'm agree. Eventually you're going to feel uh, like, would you want your parents knowing this is happening? Would you want your kids to know this is happening? Yep. Most people would say, no, like that's not something that they would want their kids to participate in. And so, like you said, when you're when you reflect on it, like, no, this isn't, this doesn't fit. I shouldn't be doing this. For you to exit that, I think that sets an example for so many other people who get stuck in that same loop of, I need money. I've got to pay, pay my bills. This is one of the ways to do that. So I understand people wanting to go into that, but I think there's so many other ways to monetize your your creativity, your passion, your Man. drive in alignment with your values. Man, I love that. Yep. I, I actually, my husband, he would say to me, like, you know is this all you want to do? Like, you don't think, you know, you have any other skills besides this? Like, you know, and I, I realized I do have so many other skills besides that. But it was it was really sad because a lot of the men that were subscribing to OnlyFans um, and uh, they were married men um, that are very lonely. And so what do you think is a driving force for men, especially if they're – and the reason why I say men is because it's mostly men. Sure. You know what I mean? I'm being honest and just real here. Yep. Um, there, I'm not saying there isn't women that get hooked onto those things. But I think 
I think women like the more just fantasy of being loved. I think we're kind of groomed that way from watching Disney <laughs> movies. <Yeah. laughs> I want the prince and, and stuff. But men, it's just very easy for them to just get turned on. It's just what's appealing. Um, so why do you think this is mainly happening for like men and married men um, getting it, subscribing to these platforms? And, and Yeah, that's a great question. I think so many men that I work with are just like they feel lonely. Yeah. And even in their romantic relationships, just because you're married, in fact, being married and being in a bad relationship can feel more isolating and lonely than being single. Wow. And so if you're struggling in your marriage and you don't know how to connect with your spouse, your intimacy is broken down, you don't feel close in any level, like that that hurts, like that's legitimate pain. And I think for many people, they turn to some kind of a behavior or a substance to get away from that pain. Mm. And so when guys are struggling with low self-esteem, they don't feel like they're good enough. They feel all this pressure of like, I'm not providing and I'm failing and I can't get anything right. That's That weighs on them. And most men, they're exposed to pornography. The average age of exposure is between 9 and 11. Wow. So it's like it's it's they're kids, right? Yeah. And so as kids, having their brain impacted and shaped because of this conditioning, it, that, that carries with them for many, many years. And so, yeah, when they're married, if they've been stuck in this web for a long time, they're going to eventually go back to that if they don't solve the problem and get the tools and the habits that they need in place to do that. So I think a lot of people are struggling with emotional pain and they turn to OnlyFans, they turn to pornography, they, they, they turn to these behaviors that help them escape how bad things feel. Yeah. So it's not the wife's fault. It's never a wife's fault. Yeah. So many women start to feel like it is their fault or their husband blames them like, well, you know, you're not having sex enough with me, so I have to go somewhere else. The reality is mm. that's it's just not true. And even if you're in a relationship <laughs> that the, your intimacy is broken down, it's still not justification to go out and do this. Right. The, the, the goal is to then solve the problem and how do you guys reconnect? But yeah, I just think a lot of men turn to this because it's an escape from how bad they feel. And it's just been how they've done it for such a long time mm. that they just keep going back to it. I just have some random thoughts, too. Um, like when you say they feel bad, too, do you think that there could be some advice we could give to the wives to help them? Because one book like I have and I just talk about is like to magnify the king in him. Like no man wants to lay down with their mom. You know what I mean? Like yep. your yep. intimacy could also be broken because he wants to feel like desired yep. and the king in the bedroom, not like it's a chore and that you're his mother that nags him and belittles him all day. And then he has to try to find you sexually attractive and you want him to find you sexually attractive. So it's like that's just me putting my input yeah, straight on the I table, true. man. Yeah, yep. <laughs> but what are some pointers like you could give to wives as well to probably help with that? Um, I mean, I think all that's true, especially coming from a woman. A woman in your relationship, you can tell if there's tension or distance and it affects the sexual relationship. If you guys are not in a good spot, then it it's, it's it breaks down in so many other ways. And so I think for women listening, I think it's important to recognize that everybody has, a, in a relationship, we all want to connect emotionally, whether it's physically, intellectually, like that's a part of a relationship. Yeah. And usually when there's a breakdown in the sexual relationship, that's a symptom that somewhere else is broken down. So if a wife doesn't feel seen, if she doesn't feel loved, if she doesn't feel like she matters to him, she's not a priority to him, her willingness or likelihood, the likelihood of her being want, wanting to be intimate with her husband goes way, way down. Yeah. And so I think for both people to understand, okay, what's important to help them feel loved and seen? So for men, in many cases, it's through affection is through intimacy mm -hmm. uh, men tend to higher testosterone levels typically higher sex drives that's a part of what helps them to feel desired just like you said mm -hmm. so i think if both people can understand what the other person's blueprint is to help them to feel loved and that becomes their focus the whole their whole relationship is it, it's like it lights it on fire in yeah. such a good way because they're meeting each other in the ways that they need and then whenever there's breakdowns again as a therapist my goal isn't to push anybody to do anything. So if a wife is just like, nah, just, I'm not interested in this and I don't really feel close to him. Dang. The goal isn't to like encourage and force her to do it. It's like, well, help me understand where is the breakdown? How, where, where are things stuck for you? Do you feel close to him? Well, no, not really. 
Do you feel like your needs are getting met? Getting met? No, not really. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start there to build this bridge so you both can feel like your needs are getting met so that you can ultimately feel like you're important in the relationship. And when that happens, I think intimacy is a very, it's, it's a much easier thing to resolve. I love that. I loved how you broke that down. I was uh, thinking too, just to piggyback off of you, is that um, I started telling women, and I, I wrote it in the ebook as well, but like kind of like I, what I started doing was just fake it till you make it. So like just speak life into your man. And what will happen is even if you don't believe it, and I was have, actually having a conversation, and she was like finding every excuse not to like love her husband. And I was like, why don't you just start pretending like just start speaking life into him and then he's going to want to be that man and then you're going to start finding him attractive because he's going to start walking in the words and the the life you speak on him every time you speak death and you're super negative and you're like look you failed once again you didn't hear me once again you're this you're that it's like okay well i'm not even going to try yep. and then you just keep looking down on him he's not even moving forward so if you just kind of fake it till you make it like you know what honey you're amazing you so fine like you just fake it your brain is going to start like believing the words that are coming out of your mouth and he's going to start becoming and evolving into the man you speak on him because he doesn't you see him in such a great light even if you're faking it you you're saying you see him in such a great light he wants to be that man mm -hmm. um men are really easy by the way <laughs> <laughs> men are really easy I, I've, I've learned so much about men men being um being a woman, when I started focusing on myself and like just to get a little bit spiritual, um, how we are kind of like the helpmate. One thing I've I've learned is that with and I won't speak on all men, but I will speak on majority that I have seen is um, is that when you're just being the because the fact that they have the desire to be respected and just to be desired when you just become that woman in the household and you just focus on yourself and how I can help him. He just starts changing. He just starts walking into the words you speak on him because he feels desired there and he doesn't want to lose that. You yep. know what I'm saying? They yep. go to wherever they're getting the dopamine, yep. like we're saying. Yep. So I just wanted to speak on that. Like be his be his rib, you know? Yes. You know? I, there's so much wisdom in that because I, I, I can see there's a, there's such a place for action and there's a place for I – th I think about them like handbrakes. Like if you're in a car and you're slamming on the gas – and the car's not going anywhere. And then when it does, it like grinds and it's not really effective. If there's a, if there's a handbrake on, it gets in the way of mm. sustained progress. I think there's a place for both of those pieces. If there's something that's blocking you from feeling and expressing love, it's absolutely worth figuring out what that is, giving that the attention that it needs. And just like what you said, if you're just taking action, that helps to change the energy in the relationship too. Yeah. So even if you're pointing out smaller things or you do give them a hug or you start to help become a source of encouragement. This is true for both people. Right. It does have the capacity to help resolve some of why that's not the case. If they feel unloved and like they're not getting anything right, then of course, like interactions are going to be more tense or more distant. So I, I like what you're saying too. There's definitely a place for taking action and helping the other person get their needs met, which then changes their feeling so that they're going to want to follow through. I had a friend one time he was telling me this was years ago and he was just like, you know, if, if my wife would just understand that her affection, her closeness, her intimacy, when that's when we have that in a good place, I will do anything for, for her. her. Yeah, there's like, easy. I'll do anything for her just because I feel so loved. Yeah. My needs are getting met. And it's not again, it's, just, it's not just the physical pleasure, but it's just what that represents. Yeah. I'm desired. My my wife cares about me. I'm enough. And when a man feels that they Nothing will stop them from following through on what the... Yeah, I, so I agree. Think, yeah, it's just both elements can be so helpful. Oh, yeah, I agree. No, 100%. I was... I... When I talk to women, I always focus on them. Like, they're always, like, shocked. Like, what about all these things he's doing? It, men are so easy to me. Like, <laughs> what is he eating? Is he eating too much soy? Maybe he's... Maybe the diet is poor. And so just... You're the cook in the house. You're the housewife. Like, make him some more nutritious meals. Maybe start feeling better. His head's a little bit more clear. And then add those skills like i just always am looking at how can you know we as women help him to elevate him and and i just seen my husband become a completely different man from that i mean he used to say things like i will never do this i'll never be this and then just me changing he's like oh i'm gonna be this i'm gonna be like it's like ah <laughs> uh, 360 i think <laughs> women don't understand their superpower Truly. in that house the being i saw a video where 
this guy, um, he was an atheist and he was a doctor and then he found God and he was breaking down. Just it was beautiful. And I'll have to show you after. But he was saying that basically that the wife is the heart. You know, she's the nurturer. She is the heart um, and he's the brain. He's the head. Um, and so being that heart, you got to put that emotions into it. You got to tell them, you know, sometimes who, who they are and put the feelings there. So great. You're right. I think people underestimate the influence that they have on their partner. Mm. So like you said, to just love on your husband to show him that you care, that he's respected. Something inside a husband changes when they feel that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I just I, I think as a testament, that's that's cool to hear that your experience. Uh, you've seen that. Yes. Trying to help out there, yeah, man. That's good. So I have a okay, another crazy question. So uh, that and I really want to get your thoughts on this. Um, so I was d- doing some research because, again, just learning about men and how they are and uh, and d- d- just the factors of like the man being the head of the house and when he's not and and he's letting the woman run things or he's just trying to appeal to everything she wants or whatever, right? He's not being the head and the leader. Um, a lot of divorce happens that way as well. And um, I was looking up, there was some research I did on male feminists. Now it's very hard to find on Google because they filter out everything. Yep. And I learned conspiracy theory, but I learned that they'll hide some truth. Yep. They'll hide a lot of truth. So when you look up stuff, they're going to be in favoritism for like feminists and the liberal side of things. Um, but I did come across some research from a couple of sources. One was the Conversation Inc. And they were talking about how male feminism, you know, male feminists of today's feminism, a lot of them is because another a drive for them is sexual opportunity. A lot of them are just claiming to be male feminists for sexual opportunity. Uh, and I wanted to get, me, yeah. yeah, I wanted to get your <laughs> thoughts on that because even me as before, when I think about it, my husband is definitely not a male feminist. He believes in, of course, women having when we're talking about feminism, of course you had the when it first originated, um, where women are treated as human beings and having rights, but now it's like it's just like trying to make men women or just go against their natural biology and he's not that and he has no shame in that if i'm in the house trying to tell him to act like a woman he's like i'm a man yeah. period yeah. you're not gonna do that <laughs> and i remember dating men that were like in favoritism of me or trying to put me on this crazy pedestal um and I see now that they utilize like my vulnerability and me feeling these emotions of like I want to be heard and all these other things to have sex with me. And they weren't, you know, even men I stayed with, I just punked them and I controlled them and, you know, everything. So I, that's a lot to say. What are your thoughts on the, the this wave of male feminism and what your advice is to for all of that yeah i mean i think that wouldn't surprise me at all i could see how somebody would use that as a way to manipulate yes it's just a manipulation tactic and so i think feminine like i think women are equal Mm -hmm. we're not the same but we're equal in value we have different contributions in many ways we have different gifts and different talents and so yeah i could see that that being something that's distorted again for somebody to just try to get their own way and ultimately um, if they're seeking just to have more sex with women and that's like, oh, if this woman likes this, then I'll tell her this just to have that from her. Yeah. So yeah, I just, I, I think it's just a distortion. Again, we go back to this, the, the, the thread that we had earlier. I think Satan's going to try to take a good thing and distort it and yeah. make it seem like a bad thing. And so for a husband to be a leader in the family, his role is to protect, right? Protect, presi- to preside, to provide, to be the foundation so that then then they can have a unit where they're working together. Right. A mom's role, a mother's role, a woman's role is no less it's no less valuable. Yeah. Both it's the yin and the yang, and so unless you have both pieces there working together, if you have two men or two masculine energy or two feminine energy, yes, say that. <laughs> and it doesn't. Yeah, it's not. It's not supposed to be like they're supposed to be. We're working in harmony, and we were born with certain gifts on purpose. Right. So to try to make a woman more into a man or vice versa. It's just, it's in conflict with how it's supposed to be. Yeah. I was, and I was even talking to Trevor, which who people that don't know who Trevor is, he's the one that runs this whole thing. <laughs> um, but I was talking to him that one of the, the, just to speak off of feminine energy, that also like when men don't know their role and they're 
they are be, being more like women, being more emotional. Women don't even like that. They complain about that. They're like, dude, you know, we can't both be whining with each other and going at it and just sharing our feelings. Somebody has to have the emotional intelligence to guide and see past all the emotions and lead us out of here. Yes. If we're both just coming at each other with emotions, you know, or if the woman's even carrying that and she's always doing that for him where he's the emotional one and she's becoming more masculine, she gets drained and burnt out because when she gets pregnant, has kids, she's more emotional. She's like, dude, <laughs> like, gosh, darn it. I can't do this. Like, I'm not you're you don't have to care the babies. I do. I'm the one feeling all these feelings. I need you to take on that role. Um, so I don't know if your thoughts. I agree. About that. No, I just I think women who feel burdened by all the responsibilities it affects them burns out their energy they feel stressed to their limits and so when a husband comes in it's like hey uh it's been a little while and wants affection or intimacy she can't even think about that because she's taking on too many things that should be mm -hmm. shared between them yeah so i just yeah i think i think understanding that we each have different contributions all right and aligning with those make it so we we f we feel energized by what we're doing instead of drained by the stuff that we that that somebody else should be participating and helping us with. So, as a therapist too, do you think that um, just advice to men that if they take on a more masculine role and they are doing their part, that their women will find them more attractive in the bedroom and they will both have a better sex life? One hundred percent. Women want to feel safe. They want to be taken care of. They want to know that their husband or their man is taking care of things so that they can relax. One thing that is opposite to sexual desire is anxiety and mm. stress. And so if a woman is overwhelmed and stressed and feeling anxious, it's like a teeter-totter, right? Sexual desire and intimacy, sexual desire and anxiety are on the, are on the teeter-totter opposed to one another. Mm. So if she's overwhelmed and burdened and tired and no energy... Her drive is going to be low. And for men, they're like, well, wh why is that the case? Because that's not always the case for them. Right. They can feel stressed, but sex is a, a source of relief for that. It's not the case for it's women. It's very different. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. So to expect that she's that way is just, it's setting yourself up for conflict in the relationship because that's just not how it is. So I think for husbands to understand those are on the same teeter totter and you can help with that and provide, be the role, be the, the leader that is supposed to support her and help her to feel safe and know mm -hmm. that she's going to be okay and that you've got things covered. It allows her to relax. And ultimately desire is born of feeling relaxed, knowing that things are safe. Wow. I love that. So we talked about this on the phone. Got to bring this up. Do men and women view sex differently? And you kind of told me a little bit about a study and I would love for you yeah. to talk about that study. It's so man. interesting. Okay. So it's different. Yeah. For men and women, it's different. What motivates them is different. Their experience is different. So there's a study that they did that they took a group of men and women separately and they had them watch this uh, video on the screen. And for two one hundredths of a second, they flashed this picture like this erotic material on the screen. So that's so fast that you can't consciously register that. It's two one hundred mil uh, two two one hundredths of a second. But all that data is there. Your brain is still receiving that data. Mm -hmm. And so what they found is they were monitoring what would happen in the brain when they were exposed to sexual material. So for the men who were, ex were, were uh, exposed to that, that sequence, they were watching what happens in the brain as compared to what happened to women. So for a woman, the part of the brain that lights up is the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that's in charge of reasoning, long-term thinking, rationality, judgment, that part of the brain lit up when they were exposed to that material, whereas for a man, that part of the brain did not light up. And so what does that mean? It means that when a woman is exposed to a sexual situation, she has to think through, am I safe? Is this okay? What kind of dangers are here? Can I trust this person that I'm with? She has to run through that subconsciously because, again, the brain is just – it operates in many ways subconsciously, like our rational, our decision-making process – she has to run through all of those things to recognize like, okay, I guess I am safe. Mm. It is okay. Then desire and arousal happen after that. Whereas for men, that part of the brain didn't light up. They, didn't, yeah. they don't have to scan and assess, am I safe? Is this person going to hurt me? What's going to happen after this? Their brain, our, men's brains don't have to think like that. And mm. the, one of the reasons why is because women are responsible. Physi they're physically 
the baby grows inside of them. They're responsible for the childbirth. In many cases, they're responsible for nurturing and raising the child, of course, with the man's help. But they share, they they often take the the majority of the burden of that. Yeah. So I again, nature, God has designed it to make it so she needs to feel safe in order for her to be intimate because that's really biologically the purpose of intimacy. Yeah. So I just thought it was fascinating. That is men fascinating. and women, they're, they're, they're different. They're not there the same. There are. Yeah. And, and, and what feminism has done, I, I'm sorry, I just am not a feminist. No, like, I'm just not. <laughs> well, just not today's feminist. I push it really hard because it was one of the reasons why my marriage was failing because I was a feminist and I had these ideologies and I thought that men and women should be the same. And just learning that and just even you stating that is really, really important. Um, and uh, just to piggyback off of what you said, this is why I talk about with women is like it's really important to mate well. And they knew that back in the day. And now we just trying to normalize casual sex. Yeah. Feminism is like pushing today for women to have casual sex and act like a man. But it's very clear that men and women are very different. Women are at far greater risk, I've learned, to contract an STD. You also, every time you open your legs, could get pregnant by this man. So yep. to just have sex with random strangers and just do the basics, like, uh, is it safe enough here? Okay, cool. That's not enough. Right. <laughs> you could get pregnant and have to carry this child for nine months, and you are in a completely vulnerable state yep. when you are pregnant. You are at risk for childbirth, which you could die in childbirth, like, this was taken far more seriously back then. I was learning that um, some men – were you the one who said it? Nope. Someone else said it. I, I, I saw that not even the full uh, – not even all men were having sex. It was the men that could provide back then, like the kings and stuff like that, that were procreating. Yep. And they had multiple wives, and they could take care of everybody and the children. So – just a lot. There's just a lot there. And I just wanted to bring on a therapist and someone and a psychologist that specializes in this stuff to really magnify this, you know. Um, and I think it adds to levels of happiness. They've done so many studies that talk about monogamous relationships. People, couples who are married have better sex lives. Yeah. There, there is a monogamy that's, that accompanies that. Their devotion and energy is channeled to one another. Which again, going back to what we talked about with pornography earlier, when something comes between a husband and a wife, even if it's a picture, it still has the impact of I'm not the only one anymore. Wow. His desires are somewhere else. His preferences are with somebody else. That undermines what is supposed to be something shared between just the husband and wife. Yeah. So at the levels of satisfaction are higher in a relationship. Levels of satisfaction and intimacy are higher. When you are in a monogamous, monogamous relationship, Without this being undermined by these outside influences, I do, and and you kind of touched on this in the beginning, but and I, um, I just want to speak on it. So when a man is abusing like sex and the dopamine, he becomes more lazy and not mm -hmm. reaching his full potential. Yes, right. And any more thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, neurologically, what happens is when you flood your brain with dopamine. Dopamine is supposed. To, so again, it, it's really interesting research on this. Dopamine is designed to motivate you. Mm -hmm. So if you have this goal that's out there, goals take time and effort and energy to accomplish. Right. Relationships take time and energy to foster. And so you get these little... So, so again, listening to different neuroscientists talk about this. If you think about back when we had to hunt for our food, when a person who was out there saw a, like some, some tracks, some animal tracks, dopamine would be released in the brain to give them a boost of energy so that they can seek the food. Because wow. food gives energy. But so what do you do? You don't have any food. You're hungry. So how are you supposed to get energy? Again, I think God has designed us in a way that you get drips of dopamine to give you energy to achieve the goal. Right. The problem is that when you flood your brain with dopamine without having to do any work, then that's what makes people lazy. Mm. You lose motivation. You lose the will and the drive to have to work hard to have to delay gratification. If all I need to do is click two buttons and my brain is flooded with dopamine, I have unlimited novelty with what I look at, who I look at, it just weakens us as a, as a, as a species. Yeah. In fact, there's again, there's this really interesting uh, bit of information that, that I think is relevant and I think people should hear, yeah. is back in the Korean War in the 50s and back in the ne Vietnam War in the 60s, one of the psychological warfare tactics that the U.S. did was they dropped leaflets of pornography in North Korea, in the Korean War, South Korea fighting North Korea. 
So the U.S. would drop basically porn over the, the battlefields where the soldiers were, which was designed to demoralize and to uh, affect the Korean soldiers to distract mm -hmm. them as wow. a way of psychological warfare. It's because it's, it's such a powerful force and it was so taboo in their culture that it would affect them psychologically. So, and again, it's hard to measure like, okay, what was the specific impact of that? But the fact that the U.S. is using that as like a war tactic, right? you think about, again, like linking this to Satan, like this is literally a war tactic. Distract people with this, divert their attention to something that keeps them stuck. Right. It's, it has the potential to become addictive. So he's going to use this to try to affect men, women, relationships. And so I just think it has such a big impact in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And it makes it so people don't achieve their potential. If they're lost in these dopamine seeking behaviors, they're not accomplishing their goals. They're not focused on what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And which again, ultimately leaves us so we're not fulfilling our potential. So qu quick question too, and thank you so much for stating that that's wild <laughs> i know right <laughs> using porn to distract soldiers yes. wow that shows how powerful tactic. yeah that shows that definitely shows how powerful it is um so real quick too um that i wanted to state was well, i have so many thoughts sorry i'm like so off track because we do have we do have these you know, sick industries like the sex trafficking and child trafficking and things like that. And I know Satan is perverting our minds. And now you can go on even the things that could you can see and come across in porn that can plant these crazy ideas in your head is insane. Like now you can see on porn, I know like they'll say, oh, my child having sex with my child or my stepchild and all these little seeds to lead to you craving to be with a kid, yep. you know? Yep. So if you want to talk a little bit about that, like the seeds that it can plant, that Satan can use porn to plant even sicker seeds. That's why you have child sex trafficking. That's why you have all these things and these ideas that people come up with. But go ahead. Sorry. It's a horrible <laughs> industry. Like legitimately, yeah. it's a horrible industry. And going back to the billboard that I saw going on the freeway, when I'm driving to church, I see this billboard, like how, how big of a difference between what the world does and what, you know, what, what we're supposed to be doing here. Right. I think that's one of the, so neurologically, like we said earlier, it takes more and more to achieve the same level of dopamine. So when somebody watches pornography and they watch it for a month, whatever the thing is, like let's say it's just like basic stuff them continuing to look at that doesn't give them the dopamine release that the brain now needs because the threshold keeps moving up. Mm. And so people find themselves looking at stranger and stranger and weirder things because they have to in order to receive that release of dopamine. And sadly, this is a part of what happens. It progresses to illegal things. Yeah. And so it pushes the line, it pushes the limits, which then shapes how people see other people. They become objects, they become just things that are sexualized. And again, like it gets into scary territory with kids. Things that in the beginning people would think, oh, I'd never do that. Slowly, their brain gets shaped and conditioned to seek stranger and stranger things, which in many cases it can lead to that. Right. Which is, again, it's just it, the whole industry is just it's it's a distortion of what should be in it. And it causes so much damage worldwide. Like this is one yeah. of the number one there are so many organizations now that are fighting against child sex trafficking yeah. because of how pervasive and how global this is now. Yeah. Because I and I think the porn industry facilitates all that. Yeah. Just it just even to adding to a random thought as I was thinking about, and this is just for I think today if I were to look at porn, it just would probably just be gross because sure. God really helps cleanse the mind and when you start yep. seeing images like that you're like oh like yep. i'm just thinking about this woman if she's being held against her will and just yep. that guy's like gross you know and and i remember it was like one of the times where i was like i need to st i can't be watching porn because i came across a video where it was a demon with like it was animated but it was like a demon having sex with a person like a character and it was a bunch of demons together and i was like this is the devil it is. like it's so clear in my head yep. it's literally a devil having sex with you yep. like that's how deep that goes and 
it's perverting my mind that I could sit here and watch this demons having sex and it's all this imagery and be okay with this, you know? Yes, man, that's such an interesting insight. Yeah. Because if you see this representation, like that represents reality. Yeah. Like if you could see into the other world, I, you know, th I, I believe spirits are, are here, right? Yeah. They're influencing us for both good and evil. If you could pull the curtain back, I think that that's exactly what we would be seeing. The devil is in the details of all of this stuff. So for you to see that, it sounds like that had this impact on you. It's like, what am I? No, I shouldn't be doing this yeah. anymore. Yeah. Well, even, you know, we just bringing God into this is like, you know, Jesus died for me. And I believe that this is like not my body. It belongs to God not um i'm abusing the body god gave me and this comes from everything i mean food or anything but mm -hmm. like god just watched me do all of that sure. and he gave me the ability to live you know and get close with him and i'm using his this body that doesn't deserve to be here to like watch demons having sex yeah, <laughs> like, I know, right? no, yeah. thank you yeah so <laughs> that's just to bring god a little bit into it um and so I had to bring that up and like about, again with the seeds that it's planting and things like that. Um, and I've asked you a couple other questions on the phone, but I want to get into this one. Um, what secret battles do to, to the women, to the wives or to just women in general, what secret battles do men face that women should try to understand? I mean, I've worked with. I've probably done 15,000 hours of therapy with people. So I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of men. And one of the most common threads that almost every guy that I work with feels is just this fear of not being enough. They feel like they're failing in their relationships. They feel like they're not good enough in their, in their marriage and at work with their kids. They're not making enough. They're not good looking enough. Like, I'm not blank enough is the most common thread that I think men struggle with in particular. There's just a lot of pressure I think that they face, that we face, to be and do certain things. And if we're not hitting that mark, so many people struggle under the weight of that. Mm. And so I think many women don't understand the pressure that that is. Not that we're looking to like be pitied, but when there's understanding and compassion for the load that somebody is carrying, it can influence how you interact with them. Going back to what you said earlier, if you pick out things that you see your spouse, your partner doing, and you highlight that, it's like this breath of fresh air. It's like so energizing to feel like, oh, like something I did was enough. Yeah. Something I did was acknowledged, like, okay, awesome. And then that if that becomes a pattern of you guys building a relationship where you can support each other and again when a wife can respect her husband and share with him how much she values him and recognizes what he's doing it lands right on that sensitive insecurity of i'm never getting enough right i'm always hearing about the stuff that i'm not doing well right and i think that that's a hidden battle that i think many many men struggle with i do think that it's because men live life i know they're more logical um, I like to say, and I watch videos where it's like women live in more like the Lulu land, like where just want peace and happiness, right? <laughs> but men live in a more everything's on a hierarchy, and that's why you guys are a lot more tougher because you guys are a little bit more realist of like if I'm not doing this, I'm not this type of man. If I'm not like these men are doing this right now, and I need to be there. So is it because you guys think a little bit more? And just again, I want to utilize this episode and just my podcast to talk about the differences with men and women. Um, and we don't need to change men to be more like women. We can acknowledge that they think differently. But is it because they think things a little bit more um, logical and on a hierarchy? I mean, I think that plays a role for sure. I think there's a few different elements. That being one, I think culture has made it such where there's specific expectations. And if you're not hitting those, then that means you're a loser. You're not doing a good enough job. Mm -hmm. If you don't make enough, if you don't have a certain kind of job. or like, There's so many different categories where if you don't feel like you're doing what you should be doing in that category, then yeah, there's pressure. So I think being logical, hierarchical, and culture, culture I think plays a role in that. Like what mm -hmm. is deemed to be successful, having a certain kind of car, making a certain amount of money, yeah. having a certain kind of wife, all that I think is just a fault. I mean, it's, I think it's again another very subtle tactic 
I think it's Satan's tactic to really influence men to feel like they're not doing a good enough job because if you have a man who doesn't feel good about himself, it's really difficult for him to show up in the way that he should. Yeah. And so if he's beating himself up and his wife is, you know, criticizing him, he's not going to feel super motivated to make changes. He's not going to feel like he has the capacity to make changes. Wow. So I think there's a lot of pressure, yeah, from from multiple different angles. And is that a reason why men are the ones committing suicide as well? Because they just fall deeper into a depression because of that. I think that's a part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely just I think people when they commit suicide, it's because they don't feel like there's any other option. Mm. It feels like the the main thread in suicide is hopelessness. That's one of the main contributing factors. Like I'm stuck here. Nothing I do is going to make a difference. I can't I can't change my situation. Therefore, this is my only way out. That's how somebody's thinking in those moments. That's not true. Of course, there are things that you can do to change and like right. but that's a big part of why people do go down that that path is they just don't feel like there's hope. Well, that was amazing to share. Um so I think just to like even wrap this up too is like wives to just understand that it's um definitely bigger than you and that um you kind of said it too and I don't know if you want to restate it but like don't take things like so personally because what you're saying it's them being beating themselves down and being hard on themselves and looking for any sort of dopamine to try to get a release just like any drug alcohol anything else it's just to feel good in the moment um so I just wanted to kind of wrap that up. Yeah, I think that's it's uh, it feels so pr- like if if uh, if a wife were to discover her husband struggling with. I don't know, a gambling addiction or an alcohol addiction or cigarettes, nicotine addiction. If her husband, if her, if if she found out on oh, my husband smokes, nicotine smokes cigarettes, she's not going to feel like what's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Why am I not, not enough for him? But when it comes to pornography use, that's the first thing that a wife thinks. What's wrong with me? Why wow. am I not enough for him? Why is his attention going somewhere else? So it's so, I think, so helpful for women to get an understanding and education about what's causing this. Yeah. Why is he doing this? Because what you'll find is for most men, it's an escape. They're distracting themselves from pain, from inadequacy, from feelings of failure. And so that's, you know, because age of exposure is when you're a young kid, you know, preteen, that often gets built into how they're coping with their pain, they're escaping in that way. So for women to understand that, I think can open the door for healing mm-hmm. for themselves personally, too. Yeah. Because if you just feel like I, I, I'm not enough for my husband, what do you do with that? Yeah. Or you can't change who you, you know, like, it's like you can make changes about habits and, you know, but like the, your essence, like who you are as a person doesn't need to change. Right. There might be certain behaviors and patterns that we all want to make some improvements on. But yeah, I think getting education as to why it's happening can really relieve a lot of pain that she feels. Mm, I actually have another question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just because, I'm sorry. Um, but what I'm sure you deal with this too, but just husbands that are struggling with that, like being lustful, having a porn addiction. I know like I know couples who deal with the husbands who are always comparing other women to their women and now putting them they have every right to feel how they're feeling because they're bringing it home with them and they're they're bringing it into their marriage. What yeah. do you say to those men or those women that are dealing with those circumstances? I, I think comparison is one of the fastest ways to torpedo your relationship. Yeah. Because if you come home with these expectations, well, so-and-so does this, or I saw this and you're not doing that, how can a wife not feel like she's not doing a good enough job? Right. And so I think having those comparisons is like poison. It poisons the relationship. It's a poison in the well. If you have things that you'd like to change in your relationship, you can do that in a constructive way or in a really destructive way where you're, comparis- you're comparing and criticizing. So yeah, I think it's if a husband is comparing his, his wife to somebody else, I think that's something that should absolutely stop. Yeah. If that doesn't stop, you're just undermining the kind of relationship that you want to have with her. So, yeah, it's just it's a destructive way to try to get your needs met. Mm. And have you ever dealt with a husband coming to you or boyfriend, fiance, whatever, that kind of fell in love with like an OnlyFans girl that doesn't even know they exist, but like probably communicates with them or they fell in love with someone. They're so attached to the idol in this sex situation yeah. this industry <laughs> it does happen i think a lot of people it escalates from just viewing things to chatting to having conversations with to developing feelings for 
Wow. So I think that that is a huge part of what undermines relationships too, is you actually foster a relationship with somebody because there's communication. I mm-hmm. think there's just, there's different levels and that's, that's a, it advances, I think, to that level for, for some people. And then that would be cheating for sure. For sure. Yeah, I mean, porn yeah, could for sure. be for some people cheating, but then. Yeah. If you're interacting and developing feelings with and having this separate, you're having conversations that are that are intimate and vulnerable and you're sharing who you are and parts of your life wow. with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a clear violation. That would hurt me more. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that would hurt me more. Totally. And that's what was happening too when I was doing um, OnlyFans is that um, it, like the, the men that would come to me, they would ha- want to have a conversation and talk about their lives. And I was like, oh my gosh, these are just a bunch of very lonely yeah. men and I'm just taking their money, you know? And yeah. so... Um, just to the women that are doing that just i think listening to and getting educated on things like this is important to know that this is a real struggle amongst men and specifically men um because of testosterone because of their nature and so it's important to um not fall into the loop of praying after it amongst with everybody else for sure i just i think there's there's other ways to make money there's ways to find purpose and fulfillment which is what god wants Yes. Finding yourself down this rabbit hole is such a diversion away from that. And it right. just it affects everybody in, in such negative ways. Yes. Well, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. me. If you guys enjoyed this podcast episode, he is a therapist. You guys can book sessions with him. Um, men who are struggling with the porn addiction or struggling with this in particular, uh, you guys can find a link below. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that outside of this. But you will find his information, his podcast, please go get the help. Um, Please seek out the help. Wives, encourage your husbands to come seek out the help as well. Um, But thank you so much for joining me. I appreciated you so much. This was such a great conversation. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. I think the work that you're doing is amazing. That Honestly, people need to hear your thoughts and your opinions because I think relationships and marriages are under attack yeah i agree so for you to have this platform yeah i appreciate you having me on here yeah thank you so much so if you guys enjoyed today's session you guys can click here to watch another episode if you guys want to experience one-on-one coaching with me where i really help people who do struggle with bpd do struggle with femininity and do have relationship issues you guys can click the link in my bio on my youtube or on my instagram bio to my pillar link and you guys will find one-on-one sessions i also have ebooks such as how to magnify the king and your husband and i'm the prize said who which are both self-reflection ebooks that have really saved and helped marriages so check those out and click this episode right here to watch more